Welcome to the Dear NICU Mama podcast. Our mission is to connect the past and the present NICU mom by bringing them out of isolation and into a sisterhood of women who can stand alongside each other as we heal and grow both in and out of the NICU. Our hope is that through interviews with trauma-informed medical and maternal mental health experts and vulnerable stories from NICU mamas themselves, that you would feel connected to the Dear NICU Mama Sisterhood around the world. So, whether your NICU journey was 50 years ago, or whether you find yourself in the NICU today, we hope that this podcast reminds you that you are not alone. This episode of the Dear NICU Mama podcast is sponsored in part by an educational grant from Prolacta Bioscience. By unlocking the biological power of human milk, Prolacta is changing the lives of critically ill infants around the world. To learn more, visit Prolacta.com. Hi, friends, and welcome back to the Dear NICU Mama podcast. It's your host, Martha and... Ashley. And Martha's cat. I was just going to say that. (laughs) Look at how fat she is. Oh, my God. Are you going to be okay back there? (laughs) She's just getting ready for her afternoon snooze. You should tell everybody about the pouch. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, anyone can Google it. But, you know, cats have something called a primordial pouch. So not all mammals do. Like dogs don't have it. But it's a big old pouch of of, of, um, love and fluff and fat that protects their internal organs. But, man, does this one, it sloshes. And when she, we have the, live in an old home, like a hundred-year-old home, and the stairs are really narrow. And so when she goes up and down the stairs like a teeter-totter it's like everything's <laughs> splashing all around i'm just surprised that she is i don't know doesn't have diabetes I, she might <laughs> she's a she's a big gal she's a big gal i love it anyway so nicu's not related to nicu but we all have like a little pouch after our baby so i think it applies this is true this is true sure. yeah it applies um and uh yeah I definitely identify with my cat that way. We do have similar body types now, and that's okay. I love it. I love it. She's a lover. She loves herself. You know what else I love about animals that we should probably start doing, Ash, is like, you know how dogs and cats will just throw themselves on the floor and just like let everything hang out. out. Oh, yeah. Because they love themselves and they're like, my body is amazing. We should do that. They're also just very blissfully unaware, too. (laughs) No, I I'm gonna go with there. There have an abundance of self love. I'm gonna I'm gonna emulate my cat. Well, friends, it's uh, spring is sprung in North America, kind of. Well, sort of. Yeah. Did we have a snowstorm up up north last week? Yes, we did. We absolutely did. Martha was driving her minivan in a snowstorm in the end of April. It was mm-hmm. wild. Yep. We were doing our outreach event and did some recording for some content for our new website update, which is exciting. Um, and there's nothing like driving through a blizzard and then hearing the the tornado siren go off. <laughs> and I thought, what? And how? And why? And why? <laughs> Listen, we don't have the spiders. Um, well, kind of, though. They're different types. Of, they're not the ones They're not that the tarantulas. Yeah. yeah, that's true. They're still gross. They're like the anyways. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I was just going to go into my basement and my dehumidifier that I use to repel millipedes. And I thought, wow, we really don't need to go down this route. <laughs> okay. Um, well, friends, um, as you can tell, we are in a good mood. We hope you're in a good mood because we're nearing the end of cold and flu season, sort of, kind of. Um And also sunshine is so good for you. I hope that you're all doing something beautiful and loving for yourself today and this week. Uh, As you know, on the podcast, sometimes we'll be able to interview experts in the field of neonatology and maternal mental health, obstetrics, physical therapists, you name it. And other times we get to interview people just like you, parents of NICU babies from around the world who share common stories. Um but also have a unique journey themselves to to tell. And that's who we have today. Um, Welcome, Leah Jackson. You are a friend of a friend on this podcast. So now you are (laughs) our 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 friend. friend. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here and for enduring that intro. You know, wow, three minutes, 49 seconds of of pure joy for you. (laughs) Talking about pouches. Yeah. Full laughter. (laughs) I love it. Well, 
to all of our mamas tuning in, uh, it was wonderful to have a little bit of a spring break, but we deeply miss you guys. It was a jam-packed weekend, but it's wonderful to be back. And if you are tuning in for the very first time, welcome officially to the Dear Nick Mama podcast. Our season six has been focused all about growing our families after NICU. And Leah's story is a perspective and a journey that we find to be crucial in sharing. Mm -hmm. And the reality for many of us in this sisterhood is that sometimes the choice to carry more children after NICU is no longer an option, whether that be by by personal choice or by emergent choice by uh, physicians. And so, so uh, Leah, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing about this reality. We know that your story is going to bring hope to so many of us. Thank you guys so much for having us. I'm so grateful to Brandy for connecting. Yes. <laughs> us too. <laughs> Brandy Walcott, who's who's talk, been on the podcast before, shared about her sweet, sweet boys and yes. um, uh, is just a lovely, all around wonderful person. Um, and if you don't follow her on Goodreads, you absolutely should. She has the best book recommendations. I was just looking at it last night. She's <laughs> wonderful. I follow closely behind her on those. We, are, we have our very own book club. Oh, and I just I love, love it. it. <laughs> oh, the best kind of friends are the friends you read books with. I love it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So fun. Well, Leah, can we hop right in to your story and your journey? Um, we would love for you to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about your NICU motherhood journey before we dive into some of the deeper parts of the episode. Absolutely. Um, so I am from Cleveland, um, born and raised here, and um, I am a mama to twins plus one. Um, I started my motherhood journey, um, with actually two miscarriages. Um, they were early, um, but one of them did require a DNC. Mm -hmm. Um, and I finally, after another year of trying, um, we were able to get put on Clomid. Um, it only took a month. Um, and I was pregnant with my daughter, um, and it was a normal pregnancy, right? Like I did all the things we registered, we did, we just did it all. And 40 weeks and three days, I went into the hospital on a Saturday morning to be induced. And I had her, you know, nine, 10 hours later. Mm -hmm. um, and everything was normal. Um, my family was there and it was just, it was like a big party. Um, it was obviously pre COVID. So you could do all of those fun things. Right. <laughs> um, then, uh, you know, two days later we left the hospital and it was rainbows and puppy dogs and life just continued on. And we were a family of three. Um, we then decided we were going to start trying for baby number two, um, and after not being able to get pregnant again, we did another round of Clomid, um, again, only took a month. Um, and we were the lucky recipients of the buy one, get one deal. Um, we have boy, girl twins. Uh, so, um, their um, birth story, of course, is not nearly as exciting um, as my first one was. Um, they were born at 32 weeks, two days via emergency C-section. Um, my water broke on a lovely Tuesday afternoon at home. Um, and I went to the hospital and they said um, both of them were a breach. So we knew at that point that a C-section was going to be likely. Um, what we didn't know is that I would progress from uh, one centimeter to four centimeters in two hours and be wheeled right into an emergency operation. So, um, you know, the my husband put on his all of his garb and I was <laughs> draped and anesthesia was done. And, um, you know, they um, both babies came out. Um, my son was kind of stuck up in my ribs, so he had a little bit um, harder delivery to come out, but, um, they, unfortunately the hospital we delivered at did not have a NICU. So they mm -hmm. were transferred downtown, um, to rainbow babies and children's hospital and within 30 minutes of being born. Mm -hmm. Um, and I stuck my little finger into their little incubator and I said, hi, and I said, bye. And they were taken by critical care transport. Mm -hmm. Um, and by then it was 11 o'clock at night. I was exhausted. I was coming down from anesthesia and I, they said, you know what, we'll get you going to the hospital in the morning. It's about 30 miles from us. Um, they had planned to transport us by ambulance. We would be down there and at least be closer, closer to our babies. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what, that's what started it. And that's, you know, the story that, um, 
got me on this podcast mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to talk about. Um, they also spent 36 days there at the NICU. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter was um, was uh, discharged first. She came home in 34 days. And then my heart was again in two places mm -hmm. of one twin being there, one being at home. Um, and two days later, he was then able to come home. So mm -hmm. um, 36 days of, um, you know, driving back and forth, we didn't have the luxury of being able to stay at the hospital because right. we had a three-year-old at home yeah. um, and I needed to be there for her too. I couldn't just leave her um, with family and friends, which everyone was very willing to help with, but I just couldn't do that for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so we trucked back and forth um, every single day and saw them and visited, you know, put our badge on just like all of you did. Um, mm -hmm. And then we went home and we were then a family of three again. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my journey. No major um, surgeries or anything. We were we were blessed with that. Um, just, you know, the the normal nasal cannula, some extra oxygen, some feeding and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. But I mean, still, I think you you mean you touched on it a little bit, but this idea of really balancing your heart in a lot of places, like it's very hard to be away from your older child. It's hard to have two that are the same age in the, from the same pregnancy, but really different experiences. You know, they're really their own kids. And I think those of us with preemies know there's the breathing, there's the feeding, there's the, the growth part of it, and they all go on different rates. So it's really, it's such a a juggling act for you, um, emotionally and mentally. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, I could do a whole nother podcast with right. you on twins yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. you because I joke all the time that someone's like, Oh, send me some pictures of your twins in the NICU. And I'm like, well, here's two pictures. I right. have no idea who it is. Right. It, could be two, it could be the same kid twice. It could be two different kids. I have no idea. So yeah. Little plugs to all my twin mamas out there in the NICU, um, have a separate folder of pictures for baby A and baby mm -hmm. B and keep them separate because when you leave, you will not know who is who <laughs> and <laughs> just do yourself a just favor. Do that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> just label them from the beginning. <laughs> I love it. Well, and not to backtrack a little bit here, but, um, you know, the kind of ironic part of recording your episode this week is that it happens to also be Infertility Awareness Week as well. And so, um, you know, I think that's important to kind of touch on as well of that sometimes to even becoming pregnant is it has its highs and lows. And so, um, you know, I wonder, we usually leave that question for the end, but since we're focusing a little bit more on, you know, more of like the hysterectomy aspect, I'd love for you to know of just, maybe there's mamas listening who are wrestling with infertility. Um, and what words or hope would you offer them that are maybe like in those beginning or middle stages of that? Yeah. So we, um, it's interesting because we got, got pregnant um, quickly with the first two, um, mm -hmm. and really weren't even trying. Um, and we lo of course lost them, but, um, to then have to like try mm -hmm. <laughs> and do it for like a year and right. still not be able to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was wrestling with the Clomid. Um, obviously it's a very first step in infertility. You know, there's people that of course have to do way more, um, in their infertility journeys than just a month of Clomid. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's just, it kind of takes, I don't want to say takes the fun out of it, but it kind of takes the fun out of it, you know, mm -hmm. because you're like, as silly as it sounds, you like have a calendar and you have mm -hmm. these pills and you have to take them on days, you know, five, seven, nine and 11. And then you gotta, you know, make the baby day mm -hmm. 13, 15, 17. You like, it's like, it's just, it, it changes it and changes mm -hmm. your view, right? Like you just, I think people just think like, oh, you just, you know, have a, have a glass of wine and your husband has a beer and, you know, right. four weeks later you're pregnant. Like, mm -hmm. and it, it does happen like that for a lot of people. Right. But, um, there is a whole nother side of it that it doesn't happen for. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, we could be stereotypical and say, you know, let it happen when it happens. And, you know, drink some wine and, you know, have a fun night. And like, that's great and all, but 
it's just, I think the reality of it is that it's really hard for moms to watch other friends, other Mm -hmm. family, other, Mm -hmm. you know, social media influencers just get pregnant and then talk about how great it is. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think at the end of the day, um, you have to remind yourself that it's okay to be sad about it. It's Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I was angry at times. Like I would be in the grocery store and I'd be like, oh, okay, why does she get to be pregnant? And I don't like, Mm -hmm. why is that okay? Um, and it's, it's, sometimes it's okay to feel like that. Right. Like, and it's, it's not a journey that a lot of people get answers to. Mm -hmm. You don't understand why you're not able to get pregnant all of a sudden. And Mm -hmm. there is no, there's no real reason. It's just not working. Um, so I, I have a very soft spot in my heart for these mamas Mm -hmm. who are, who are struggling and still trying and, you know, miscarrying and trying again. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's hard to, to be pregnant after a miscarriage as well. Like Mm -hmm. I was scared to death the entire time I was pregnant Mm -hmm. because I was just waiting for something to go wrong Mm -hmm. because that's all I knew, Mm -hmm. right? Like my first two pregnancies, that's all I knew was something going wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you have to be um, gentle and kind to yourself Mm -hmm. um, and just remind yourself that um, it's okay to have bad days Mm -hmm. Um, it's okay to talk about it with people, whether it's your village or your sisters or your mom or whoever. Um, but it's okay to talk about it and not just keep it inside Mm -hmm. because you don't realize how many women go through infertility until you start talking about it. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. I probably know more people who have struggled with infertility or miscarriage loss or any of those that have not. Right. But so many people just don't talk about it because they're like, oh, my gosh, well, if there's something wrong with me, like, I don't want to tell people that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's hard. It's mm-hmm. really hard. And I am in such a big proponent of just of talking about it and not keeping it to yourself. Because mm-hmm. there's something we said about having a village of people around you that will cheer you on mm-hmm. when you cannot cheer yourself on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing and for honoring um the mamas in this community who may be walking through that themselves. And so I know that wasn't on our list of questions, but I was like, That's ironically, okay. this week also happens to be... I check a few be... boxes. <laughs> yeah, girl, you do. Again, multiple episodes. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go back then a little bit to um, kind of those early days when the twins were born um, and maybe walk us through kind of, you know, what happened. Yeah, so... Um... You know, it was, like I said, it was probably 11 o'clock at night by the time, you know, the twins were off and they were in the hospital, the next hospital, and I was, you know, recovering and everyone had gone home by then, you know, like, and it was just my husband and I, and he's like, you know what, just get some sleep. You're exhausted. Um, And in the morning, it's a new day. We're going to go downtown and we're going to be by them. So... I, of course, you know, quickly fall asleep, right? Like Mm -hmm. you're exhausted after birthing not one, but two babies. Um, And um, it was early in the morning. It was probably four or five o'clock in the morning um, that I can remember having really, really, really bad shoulder and neck pain. Like to the point where you have a really bad day and you're like, oh my gosh, like my shoulder really hurts, but like 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. Um, And my husband's like, okay. Like I remember him standing next to the bed and just like rubbing my shoulders. And like, I'm like, yeah, like it it helps a little bit, you know, but um, then, you know, I have a very, um, I'm very afraid of needles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't like blood drawn. I don't like shots. I don't like any of it, even at the age of 33. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were coming in to do frequent blood draws just to make sure everything was kind of where it needed to be with my labs. And I remember at like the 6, 6.30 a.m. one, um, they would come in and I wouldn't really respond. Like my husband's like, are you okay? They're like drawing your blood right now and you're not moving. And I'm like, I just like don't feel good. Like, Mm -hmm. and I think for the, the, for a while I told myself, well, you've never had a C-section before, right? Like the first one came out normal. Everything was great. So the recovery is different. Everyone talks about how the recovery is, you know, so different. Um, so I was like, well, yeah, like I probably just had two kids, you know, I just, I was just cut open. So I'm just like not feeling great. So, um, the, the nurses then started to kind of chat. I think, um, I was, I was pale, I had some hand posturing. 
I was um, not responding to commands, um, which I think they started taking note of. So um, the doctor, they were talking to the doctor and just kind of letting him know what's going on. And he said, um, you know, let's do a cold compress and let's do some IV. So after my labs at 630, they then um, ordered a blood transfusion, which after a C-section, especially with twins, I don't think is super common. Um, you do lose a lot of blood, obviously. So um, they started a they started blood transfusion. Um, they took labs again. And unfortunately, the, my numbers kept going down. Um, they did a second one and my numbers kept going down. Um, number in terms of late blood count. Um, then my it was noted that my heart rate was really high so i was um tachycardia in tachycardia if you will um and that my my blood pressure was low so in the system in the hospital world you get flagged almost immediately as being sepsis so um i remember the hospital is coming in and we're probably at like 11 o'clock in the morning now and she said um you know, I, I don't think that you're sepsis. I think that you just had twins via C-section, but we're gonna, we have to send you up to the ICU because you're getting flagged in our system as sepsis. We have to start sepsis protocol. She's like, so you're going to hear these alarms and you're going to hear people, we're going to have a team, an I team, and they're all going to come in. There's like seven people. I'm like, okay. So at this point I'm like calling my mom. I'm like, mom, I'm going on sepsis protocol and I'm going to the ICU. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I really, I don't even know. I don't even answer for you. I don't know what's wrong. I just mm -hmm. don't feel good. So I go up to the ICU and get two more. So now we're at four total blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. By about three o'clock in the afternoon, the doctor comes in who actually did my surgery. And he said, we're going to do an ultrasound because I think there might be something going on. Like, yeah, think. Mm -hmm. So he comes in, he does the ultrasound and he says, well, you um, have a lot of like fluid in your abdomen on the right side. It's like, so we're going to take you in for an exploratory laparotomy and we're just going to see what's going on. So, you know, sign here and we're going to take you in. So I signed a medical consent form. Um, and down we go. And I was really concerned. I remember being really, a lot of that day was honestly like a blur to me, mm -hmm. right? Cause I'm losing blood at a rapid rate. I'm not feeling well. Um, so I remember vividly saying, what, like, are you going to have to do another spinal? Are you gonna like, cause I, again, hate needles. So I'm like, my, my concern is like, okay, what are you going to do? You're going to cut the same incision. Like how is this happening? And they're like, yeah, you know, but we're going to give you, you know, a little glass of wine in your, in your IV and you're going to, you're going to go right to sleep and you're not going to remember anything. I'm like, okay. So I wake up from surgery two and a half hours later. It was much longer than they had anticipated. Um, they told us it was going to be about the same amount of time as the C-section was about 45 minutes total. So, um, Thankfully, one of my dear friends from high school was actually a nurse. I called her and I said, I need you to come up here. I need you to be in this room with me because I am terrified of what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So she came up there and I think she was able to like go out into the waiting room and like tell my husband, like, everything's okay. It's just taking a little longer than expected. Um, so I came out of surgery and my husband came back and I said, he said, did the doctor tell you what's going on? And I said, no. And he said, well, they just gave you a hysterectomy. And oh I said, oh, what? Like, wh what, are you, what are you talking oh about? Gosh. And he's like, yeah, he's like, everything's okay. It went well. You know, you, they did leave one ovary. So I will, let me just clarify that part. So I did have a complete hysterectomy with one ovary, meaning I will not have to go into, I will not go into early menopause. I'm not on hormones or anything. Um, but cervix, uterus, tubes, um, all that is, is gone. Um, so, and the other ovary, obviously. Um, so when the doctor came in, I vividly remember saying, so does this mean I cannot have kids anymore? And he said, if you are back in this hospital pregnant, you and I will both be in the Guinness book of world records. And I don't know anything about bedside manner, but I feel like it's probably not no. how you talk to a patient who mm -hmm. just had a hysterectomy. No. 
So I was then wheeled back up to the ICU because, of course, I just had another abdominal surgery. Um, And I will say that the ICU did not know how to handle a 29-year-old hysterectomy patient, right? Because, like, that's not what we are, that I was not – I was not that type of patient. Um, and you know, the, the nurses would come in and I, I tried to start pumping, um, which was good. I think that helped, that was good for me. I needed to do that because I felt like I could then contribute to my babies that were 30 yeah. miles away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was like, you know, is this going to work? Like I'm on a ton of pain medication. I, just had two surgeries. Like, I don't even, am I going to even have a milk supply? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. No idea. So lactation consultants were amazing. They were super helpful for me. Um, they put, you know, we put the little tiny bottles in the fridge and they said, you know, when you work out of here, you can take them downtown. So, um, I spent two more days in the ICU. I had a total of nine blood transfusions. Um, if you know Mm -hmm. anything about the human body, you have about nine, (laughs) um bags of blood nine to ten in your body so um for a whole year i have a whole nother (laughs) a whole nother person's um blood inside of me Mm -hmm. i also had a bag of platelets as well um Mm -hmm. but i mean it goes to show you just like how much blood i was literally losing yeah (laughs) like nearly my entire body was gone consider how quickly it was and how also how long (laughs) it was going before you actually had that surgery you know too Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just like First of all, I mean, what a, like a horrifying and terrifying story. And I'm so sorry Mm -hmm. that you had to live that and experience it firsthand. And, um, there's so many elements of it that are traumatic beyond just the fact that your two children are own, are also in neonatal intensive care far away from you. Right. That's the other part Mm -hmm. of it is how can you even begin to process all these things, these, this major surgery that you just happened that happened when in the middle of your head, you're thinking, I just want to be with my babies. I just want to be with my babies. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that just feeling torn by that. I'm that that's just an impossible feeling for anyone. I'm so sorry that that, that happened to you. And I'm also sorry that you didn't receive the care that you so very much deserved. And that really, um, really vulnerable. volatile yeah volatile vulnerable space that you were in mm-hmm. yeah uh, yeah and I think it's it's funny because I look back or just talking to people talking to you guys you know like you know how, were you how did you feel and I was like I didn't have time to feel yeah. anything yeah. I didn't mm-hmm. care about myself yeah. I just cared about my babies that I still have yet to see, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, count in the incubator heading to critical care transport. But I I didn't care about me. I wasn't worried about me. Mm-hmm. I was like, do whatever mm-hmm. you need to do to get me out of here. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And I just mm-hmm. knew that the surgery was going to, it was going to put me back further. Yeah. Right. Like it, I knew after having two abdominal surgeries, I wasn't just going to leave tomorrow. Um, and I didn't. Um, I had the surgery Wednesday, and I didn't leave until Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, I finally got back down to labor and delivery because I told them, like, I need to be around nurses who know how to yeah. handle my situation yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and who are sensitive yes. mm-hmm. to the fact that I am pumping, Yeah. but I am not pumping for you to give it to the baby that's bedside, mm-hmm. Yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I'm not mm-hmm. – my babies are not in the nursery right down the hall. Yeah. Um the labor and delivery nurses were true. I mean, we say this about a lot of nurses in our lives, but they are true angels. Mm -hmm. Um, They were able to put me, you know, at the end of the wing. So I could not hear the -hmm. babies crying, the moms in labor, the, you know, lullaby music that plays when babies are born. You know, they Mm -hmm. were very sensitive to the fact that it is not what I wanted to be around. Um, And I'm grateful for that. Right. Like, I, it's, they were exactly right. (laughs) Like, as you know, you hate to say that, but like, I didn't want to be around that. I didn't want to hear babies crying Mm -hmm. because they weren't mine. Yeah. Um, so while I did have, definitely did not have a fantastic, um, medical care team experience, there were those there that really, that really helped me when Mm -hmm. I needed it the most. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned that you know, obviously initially your, your priority was, I need to see my babies. I need to know that my babies are okay. 
And so I wonder then, when did you really begin to process the fact that I've just had a hysterectomy, our family building journey no longer looks the way that I had always envisioned it. I'm 29 years old. You know, when did you have the space or, um, you know, even ability to begin to process this new reality? Yeah, so I really um, didn't process what was happening until their first birthday. Yeah. So they turned one and I realized I will never celebrate a first birthday again. Hmm. Never. This is our last first birthday in the house. Um, I was put on um, Zoloft before I even left the hospital. It was not a choice of mine. It was a choice of the fact that I answered no to every postpartum depression question on the questionnaire. And I basically had every red flag you could possibly have when you left the hospital. Mm -hmm. So um, they advised that I go on it. And again, at that point, I'm like, okay, whatever. Put me on it. I don't care. Get Mm -hmm. me out of here. Um, I took it for six months. And quite honestly, it made me very numb to Mm -hmm. anything. So I am a very emotional person. I cry. I laugh. I'm mad. I'm happy. Like, I I feel it all. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fact that I wasn't feeling any of it was very, very um, uncomfortable for me. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, being on that, going down to the NICU every day felt like Groundhog's Day. Mm -hmm. And then they came out in October and it's cold and flu season, right? Like we just talked Mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. And And you have an older kid. in March. And yeah. And she was in preschool. Right. Mm -hmm. I couldn't pull her, right? Mm -hmm. Like she needed to have some normalcy in her life. So she was going to preschool. I was staying home. Um, and then I had to go back to work, of course. Mm -hmm. And then March comes along and we all know what happened in March of 2020. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then we didn't leave the house again. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like all this was happening and I didn't even have time to pay attention to what was going on because then we had COVID and you're not only worried about flu season and cold season and RSV season, you're not worried about COVID that we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so their first birthday, I like hit a wall mm-hmm. and I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. We're done with babies. We're done with first birthdays. We're never going to do any of this again in the house. And that's when I really started to seek some help. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I found another organization near and dear to my heart, um, mm-hmm. Project NICU, mm-hmm. and I found them scrolling on Instagram one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I found a therapist mm-hmm. who I saw, um, mm-hmm. saw her once a week, and we talked through it all. We yeah. talked through the fact that I was – the emotion that I think of on their first birthday was angry. Mm-hmm. Like, I was mad. I was like, how dare you make a decision that impacts my family and me for the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. Like, did it need to be done medically wise? I am sure it did, but I had no say in it whatsoever. Right. No yeah. say. Yeah. Didn't know it was going to happen. And after it happened, there was no explanation around it. Yeah, there right. was no closure from the doctor. There was no explaining what happens at 29 with a hysterectomy. There was none of it. I yeah. literally yeah. had to figure it out myself. Yeah. So I think yeah. when, you know, that one year mark really, really... You know, I was off the depression medication. So I was like, you know, I was feeling the feels, right? Right, Like you're like, okay, this is reality now. Like they're, this is it. This is your life. Um, And that's when I really, that's when I really started to seek help and realize that I like, I was not okay with everything that happened. Let's not forget that you were raising three children too, two of whom are (laughs) newborns, right? They get cut, they come up at different times and raising multiples is just really hard. So, you know, you don't have a chance to escape fight or flight when you're just Mm-mm. trying, Mm-mm. literally surviving. There's so much surviving, talk- not thriving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you talked about like kind of the systematic approach you get to get to getting pregnant when you're in, you're going through infertility. Infer- you know, I, I know that struggle. And then you come home with multiples and then again, it's, this is a systematic approach to um, surviving here. Who's getting bottle feeds? When are they sleeping? When are they napping? Blah, 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 blah. You, you kind of, in order to survive, you're doing that rather than, like you said, engaging in processing because you're just, there's no opportunity to. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, with a three-year-old whose world just got rocked yeah. by right. the fact that there's now two babies at yes. the same time. Excuse Mom me? and dad have been going well, down friends, to this right. hospital yeah. Yeah. for 36 days straight, you yeah. know, like yeah. who had no normalcy in her yeah. life. Yeah. And I felt, you know, at any given point was like, you know, I want fruit snacks and we're both feeding, right? Yeah. So it was like, okay, I'll get them for you in a minute. Like, can you just hang on for mommy? You know, like, yeah. Okay, now her, she's like, well, what the hell? Like, yeah. mm-hmm. just two months ago, you were doing everything and anything I wanted. And yeah. now I have to wait? Like, yeah. what is this yeah. nonsense? You yeah. know, so it's like also balancing her and making sure that she still feels, you know, loved, mm-hmm. important, a part of the family. Because everyone's coming over and everyone's just want to talk about the twins, right? Like, right. oh, let me see the twins. Let's see the twins. Let's, what are the twins doing? What are the twins mm-hmm. doing? So that's another balance of mm-hmm. like, again, things you don't learn in a book um, yeah. when you have one and then two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I want to commend you, Leah, for, you know, you said something when you said we hit a year and that's when I was, I think you said in my feels. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and what I heard you say though directly after that is, and that's when I sought out help. And so I want to commend you in that moment too for recognizing that Mm -hmm. I can't and don't want to do this alone, like Mm -hmm. taking that next step um, and asking for that support, finding that support, um, because I think we can say here that that's why you're here today, right, is because Mm -hmm. you found that support and now you're offering that to more moms through your work at Project NICU and how beautiful of that. So I want to also commend you that in that real deep moment of vulnerability when you were in your feels (laughs) – you decided to take that step to find support, and I think it's it's made all the difference. And so, really, really proud of you for that. Yeah, thank you. No, it, it really does. And you know, we've always, I've always said it. I've seen the quote a million times, and I'll continue to say it. You know, my I want my journey to be someone else's survival guide, mm-hmm. right? Like I watched other, especially after a year, watched these other NICU babies and these moms and like talked through it. And like that Mm -hmm. kept me going. That was my survival guide, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so my hope can only be that while this situation sucks, quite honestly, it's nothing I would ever wish upon anybody. I can only hope that there's someone else out there that's like, you know what? I need Mm -hmm. to go get the help and it's okay Mm -hmm. to ask for help. Well, Leah, again, just so proud of you and uh, want to validate that your story is Other Women's Survival Guide. And so you're doing that day in and day out. And so thank you for sharing your story and for being such a beacon of hope to so many in the NICU community. You know, one question that we wanted to ask you, and um, we've heard from women who've had hysterectomies, is kind of this identity shift that happens post-surgery. Um you know, getting your period and things like that are such a big part of being a woman and it starts at such a young age. And Mm -hmm. for it to end at such a young age, I wonder, you know, how was that identity shift for you? And did you ever walk through or are you walking through kind of some of that um, today? Yeah. So I think um, when I really started to realize that I was um, different post 2019, um, was when I would go into a doctor's office and the question they would always ask you is, when is the date of your last period? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would just, I'm like, I don't know. I don't have that. Um, January of 2019 is the honest answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But, you know, just to like, just a common question that we all answer, you know, every doctor's appointment we go to, every conversation we have with doctors on what's going on. Um it was like, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. I don't have that anymore. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. um, and at 29, like to never get your period again is Mm -hmm. just like, that was unheard of to me, you know, Mm -hmm. like, what do you mean? I'll literally never get it again. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just, it's crazy. Like you said, because you get it at such a young age and, you know, growing up, you go through getting it and how do you, you know, learning your body and what it feels like and how do you handle it? And then like, oh, by the way, go to school and go to work all while you mm-hmm. have it, right? Like you just learn so much about your body just right. at 16, right? Or whatever age. Um, so yeah, there absolutely is a shift um, afterwards. And, you know, I... Um, I don't want to say lucky because lucky is not the right word, but I am grateful to have one of my best friends also had a hysterectomy Mm. um, 
post her second her second baby um, after some complications um, also. Um, so we joke that we're Hister sisters. Um, <laughs> I have another friend who also just had one a few months actually ago, um, due to some other, you know, kind of health conditions going on, but, um, it's, it's actually kind of cool to be surrounded by some other people that mm-hmm. don't, right? Like, cause you're like, okay, you get it. Right. Like, <laughs> um, but it is, um, it's just different and it does like make you like feel I don't want to say less of a woman, but it makes you feel different. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. there's just things that I'll never do again. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never have to buy tampons and pads and, you know, mm-hmm. I have two daughters, right? So that's another thing that I'll have to, you know, teach them what to do when that time comes, you know, but like, well, this is what you do, but mommy doesn't have to do this, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's things that you just literally never think of. Um, yeah before it's your reality. Um, and I think again, like the first birthday was so, um, was so big for me because, you know, you're pumping and you're breastfeeding and you're not getting a period anyways. So like, for me, it was like, it was kind of normal, right? Like it takes a while after, you know, postpartum. Um, but then, you know, the year came up and I was like, okay, I'm not pumping and I'm Mm -hmm. not breastfeeding anymore. So like, but I'm also not going to get a period anymore either. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's super crazy. It really is yeah. like just to think about it at being again, when I was 29 and just never having to deal with those things again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it does, if you, you know, we want to put a little bit of light, some good light on it. Um, you know, I, I don't have any type of, um, chance of getting cervical cancer or, um, ovarian cancer. Obviously my chances of that are half, right? Cause I only have one, um, and uterine cancer and, you know, these other cancers that so many women are affected by these days that I, I cannot get. Um, well, I thank you for sharing that wisdom. Yeah. Too. I think that the, you know, what you were missing probably was like this kind of broader understanding of what it means to be a woman, because like you said, now you found people in your close knit community that have had the same experience. And this idea that, um, womanhood isn't defined by these things that happen to our body, but because we, we all know, like there's, there's like this wide range of women and this intersectionality now, like, um, because of what you've been through, or maybe pe- people who've never had a period, right? But like, there's all this experience. And the more that we talk about it, the more inclusive and holistic um, our communities can become, you know, the communities of peer peer support that, that we operate in. And then also, you know, the medical community, hopefully, because uh, you shouldn't have to go into these spaces and, and have to kind of redefine yourself every single time you go, you go into an office. Yeah. So I'm so glad that you share so openly. It's such an important part of, of your journey and many, many others. Um, Thank you. I wonder, you know, I, Ash and I talk about this literally all the time because this is what it means to be like a mother in America. But like people are like, when are you going to have my kids? Blah, blah, blah. You know, is it your aunt or literally like a stranger who's just like, tell me. Or like Vanessa on Love is Blind, right? Isn't that like the one question she kept asking at the reunion and people were so pissed about it? They're like, stop asking about Love is Blind babies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I. It's just, yeah, it's this idea that like people can – it's uh we have society have like defined that it's like okay I guess for people to ask these questions and it's so invasive and for you and for so many it has like a really specific question you know a really specific answer and there's a lot of context behind it that you can't stop in the middle of a supermarket and give to somebody so how do you how do you respond when people ask you that and how has your response changed over time yeah I mean I think um I think commonly I'm like, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're good with three. Um, I've never been shy. I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Right. But Mm -hmm. I have not been shy with saying, yep, you know, I actually had hysterectomy a day after I had them. So we're done. Um, almost just to like make people realize that it's not an appropriate question Mm -hmm. to ask. Mm -hmm. And it's really none of your business if I'm having more kids or not. Um, but I've always been open about it, right? Like I've never, um, 
I've never hidden it. I've always talked about it with people um, that this is, this is what happened. Um, we had a hysterectomy and we're done having kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's our reality. Um, I mean, I think obviously like there's much more that I want to say, <laughs> especially <laughs> yeah. to the lady in Target who is like, oh, you have your hands full. Are you done now? Oh, like, God. Can you not worry about if I'm done or not, lady? Like, mm-hmm. just keep shopping. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say I've, I've, I've never been shy to say that, um, yeah, unfortunately, it has struck to me, so we're done. Um, I think I've commonly, I've commonly said to people and just, it ends the conversation really quick. <laughs> if mm-hmm. you can imagine, they're right. like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> you know, your kids, your kids are great. You know, like, yeah. okay, all of a sudden, <laughs> all of yeah. a sudden I have enough in your mind. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I feel like it's men more than women too. Um, that are like, Yard. oh, are you, you going to try for one more? You know, like, no, we're not. Mm-hmm. We're done. So Right. I don't know. I hate to even entertain the question of people. Like, I don't even want them to think that it's appropriate or okay. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. yeah. it's just not, as yeah. you guys just mentioned. Yeah. But it doesn't stop people from asking it. Well, and then it goes back to like the infertility discussion of like, you can't, you don't always just try and it happens. Mm-hmm. You know, like it took us years to conceive these kids. So mm-hmm. are you going to honor that too? And we used to say you know? it after we had my daughter. You know, people are like, oh, when's the next one coming? And I'm like, we're trying, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it would happen this month if it was up to me, but it's not. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that was always like, you know, we're trying for mm-hmm. another one. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, people have one kid and mm-hmm. they're just as great of a mom as I am. Right. Because they have mm-hmm. one. Like, that's yeah. just what people choose sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Sure. My least favorite question ever. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. Next to oh, the will you pay for the child care for them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Leah, it's been such a joy to hear your story and truly an honor to hear about your experience and how you continue to advocate for women um, and mothers today. And we always like to kind of end our episodes with just a word of hope or encouragement. And so um, I wonder if you'd be able to offer some hope to other moms who can no longer carry children, whether that be because of an emergent uh, procedure like yours or whether it was something they had time to prepare for or not. How would you encourage other NICU moms listening today who've walked through something similar? Yeah, you know, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier, but I think that it's okay to mourn your past identity, right? Like, I think it's okay mm-hmm. to acknowledge the fact that you um, are no longer able to childbear, you are no longer getting a period, um, you're no longer going to annual appointments like you did before, because mm-hmm. um, it's not necessary. Um, and I think it's okay to mourn that it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. Um, but with saying all that, um, I also think that you also then have to look at what you have in front of you, right? Like I have three amazing kids, um, that I went through a lot to have. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that whatever your journey, whatever you thought your journey was going to look like, um, in most cases, I think for all of us, right, it's different. (laughs) None of us ever thought that Mm -hmm. we would be sitting on a NICU mama podcast, right? Like, that's just Mm -hmm. not what your plan ever is. Um, So I think, you know, regardless of what you thought your journey was going to be, I think you have to honor what your journey was. Um, And it's okay to be sad and it's okay to be angry, but um, take your experience and help someone with it. Um, and that's really what I try and do all the time, whether it's with, you know, um, a new friend who has a NICU baby now, or a friend who has a hyster- had a hysterectomy or whatever it might be. Um, just take your experiences and go out to the world and do good with them. Um, because I think that we need more of that. Um, mm-hmm. and it's okay to talk about it and it's okay to, mm-hmm. um, to seek help, whether it's professionally or, um, whatever that may look like for you, you know, help for everyone is very different. Um, but I think that it's, um, you know, finding your village, um, has, has helped me since day one, right? Like, 
-hmm. those people who are willing to jump in and bring over dinner or send you a Starbucks gift card or um, take the kids for the night or whatever it is. Um, Or if it's just talking on the phone, right? Like it it doesn't need to be anything monetary. It can just be, um, I'm here for you and you're not alone and we're going to get through this. Um, and I've always yeah. been an advocate in finding those people who will cheer for you when you can't cheer for yourself. Um, yeah. So I am um, happy to be a resource to anybody listening, watching anything. Um, please connect. Please talk about it, um, whether it's with me or with someone else, because it's really important that people share their stories because we are not the only ones who have been through things like this. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Beautiful. And maybe lastly, um, you know, how do you honor and celebrate your body today? Uh, you talked about kind of grieving your past identity. So, you know, what are some ways that you celebrate your body today? So I think the twins birthday, and I touched on it earlier, I think the twins birthday is always the hardest for me, right? Like it's the mm-hmm. last third birthday we're going to have in August. It's going to be the last fourth birthday we're going to have in the house. Um, and I really struggle with that, those lasts, right? Like getting rid of the high chairs and, you know, we don't have cribs in the house anymore and all of that. Like it's hard mm-hmm. to mourn that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I have always been, I've always um, struggled with the C-section scar as well. Um, I've mm-hmm. always struggled with it. I, it's never anything I ever thought I would have, especially not after having the first one. Um, mm-hmm. And I remind myself that um, I carried 20 fingers and 20 toes at one time mm-hmm. inside of my belly. Um, <laughs> and honestly, it's pretty damn incredible what yeah. women's bodies can do. Um, Mm -hmm. and I remind myself of that. Um, I, again, have an amazing group of friends who we -hmm. talk about it all the time, right? Like, um, and I think that just celebrating what your body has been through, um, is really important Mm -hmm. because, um, it's, it's a lot when you go back and think about it, um, and talk about it like this, it's, it's nine blood transfusions is a lot of blood, (laughs) to get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. and yeah. so I, I really try to remind myself, don't get me wrong. I have the days where I'm like, wow, I really don't want to wear this bathing suit today. Cause that C-section scar is looking <laughs> real great, you know? Um, <laughs> but I have three beautiful kids that are to show for that. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And one piece absolutely. bathing suits are like back in now. Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> And high-waisted jeans are my jam. Praise him. I see the low-waisted jeans. I'm like, nope, steer clear. Never again. Not going back to those. Give me all the money. Also, okay, not to be like too, uh, what's the word, vulgar, but like the way that low-rise jeans would rub against a C-section scar, absolutely not. Mm-mm. That sounds like complete torture. It's for the birds. No. None, yeah. in, none in this absolutely. house. Absolutely. High-waisted all the way. All the way. Well, all jokes aside, Leah, thank you so much for yeah, sharing. Thank you, so Leah, vulnerable. It was a joy to finally get the chance to connect with you. Uh, the beauty of this NICU community is that it's vast and broad, and we all have the chance to connect on Instagram and in different sectors. But to be able to have this one-on-one conversation with you has been a true joy. And we will make sure, too, to uh, link Project NICU's resources in this episode description. Um, they are a fantastic, fantastic support group for NICU mothers. And they have a very diverse offering of support groups that they offer. And so we highly suggest that you check them out. Um, so we'll make sure to link them in the show notes as well. But to all of our mamas listening who have walked a similar walk or who can no longer carry children, uh, we just want to remind you that your worth has never has never faltered or never changed your worth as a woman is not determined by your existence or function of a womb and we see you and honor you today as a remarkable woman and mother that you are so you are not alone this sisterhood is with you and exists to support you and walk with you and um, you are worthy and deserving of um, the message and hope that that you are not alone 
So we love you. We are so grateful for this community. Thank you for uh, continuing this conversation of building our families after NICU. We know it can be a very tender one. So we hope that after this, you have the chance to treat yourself to a yummy coffee or do something lovely for yourself. So we love you guys. We'll be back next week, but have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Dear Nikki Mama podcast. If you loved this episode, we'd be so grateful for a review on any of the podcast platforms. And we'd love to continue connecting with you via our social media pages or a private Facebook group. And ultimately, Nikki Mama, welcome to the sisterhood. 